Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through something I'm really, really excited about, guys. Gods of the Forbidden North, Volume 2, by Pulk, Pulp Hummock Press. This is, I mean, one of my favorite products I've done all year on this channel. I've only briefly looked through it. It's 532 pages of brilliant work. Now, if you guys have seen my review of Volume 1, you'll know I really, really like Gods of the Forbidden North Volume 1. Volume 2 is everything I was hoping for. It completely meets my expectations. It's beautiful. The artwork is just ubiquitous. It's almost on every page. It's just so good. The writing is great. The adventures seem really good. And again, I haven't run any of this, obviously. Just got this today. Um, this is the... I, I backed this on Kickstarter at the Sularuk Early Bird um, special level. And so I have this... I got part of the uh, initial you know, first printing files, basically. So there are probably going to be some errors in here, here and there, that are going to get caught before the book goes to print, before it's all done. Um, but I couldn't wait. I had to go through this <laughs> and give you guys my thoughts on it uh, and just show you what you can expect if you if you get this or if you're if you're getting this. So again, if you know the first edition, you'll know uh, what to expect. This is just a fantastic, brilliant book. Absolutely brilliant. Um, it's it's it's. Uh, if you haven't seen my review, I'd recommend go watching going and watching that. You'll get a, a better sense of what this one is. But um, in a nutshell, Gods of the Forbidden North is a setting with a whole, it's a hex crawl set in a kind of frigid, half tundra-like um, northern portion of this world that's being presented. It's for old school essentials, and it is just a, a cornucopia of references, of old school sensibilities, of 80s pop culture and metal and D&D &D of ages past. It's a love letter in a lot of ways to D&D, &D, and that's what this book is. It doubles down on that. There are art pieces of art that are homages to particular classic pieces of art. There are adventures in here that are um, not, I wouldn't say taken straight up from, but are heavily influenced by classic dungeons, by movies from the 80s. Uh, Big Trouble Little China's in here. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is in here. Um, we have um, Into the Unknown, the adventure. We have, um, uh, what's the, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of it <laughs> right off hand. Uh, Temple of, not Temple of Elemental Evil. I didn't notice that in here, but, um, wow, it completely just left my mind. Tomb of Horrors, there we go. I couldn't think of it for a second. Tomb of Horrors. There's an entire dungeon in here that's just an homage to the Tomb of Horrors, and it's like a death trap dungeon. You could take it straight out and run it on its own. But anyway, I'm going to go through, um, uh, this is by Robert Alderman, and there's a ton of people who worked on this. The art, there's just a whole list of artists at the back of the book. So good. There are quotes from Dante throughout. I love Dante's Inferno. I love the Divine Comedy, all three. And uh, there are quotes several times from Dante throughout this book. Essentially, the first book is detailing the overworld hex map and a lot of the locations and adventures you can find there. Volume 2 is has some adventures on the surface, but has a lot of dungeons and um, has a whole detailing of the underworld, uh, basically the, the deep below the surface in the Forbidden North. You can see the PDF is through four, 532 pages. The entire table of contents is hyperlinked. Oh my goodness, that just brings joy to my heart. You start off with essentially um, what this module is, how to run it, the different styles of play, and then you start with a couple of adventures, a few adventures, that are in sort of, they're sort of like follow-ups and conclusions to things that were introduced in the first volume. Um, and just the art throughout is incredible. Oh man, I just love it. Constant great art over and over and over. And there are a number of different artists, and so the styles can vary significantly from page to page. That doesn't bother me. It might bother some people, but it's all excellent. I didn't notice a single piece on my quick flip through before that I didn't like. I like them all. Um, so you have basically an overview of this book, how to run it, you know, basic ideas for a book this big, 530 pages of stuff different styles of play. You can play it as an adventure path, so you play through a series of adventures, or you can just open it up as a sandbox, and that's the default assumption, is that you're gonna play it as a sandbox. There's um, design principles behind the encounters, which is really cool, and especially if you wanna do your own. And then adventure reward totals, and basically after every chapter, there's a summary of the different XP you're gonna get from that chapter if you're doing XP for gold, or from monsters, or both, or whatever. So, it lays it all out here. 
the campaign of the adventure summary as a as a as an outline, and then you get each of these adventures as you go through. The Diggers of Dolgun. Great adventure. It's a follow-up to one of the sort of early, sort of introductory adventures from the first book, which was this kidnapping um, and assassination and stuff, and things were going on. There was sort of a loose end there. I talked about it in my other review, where this, this woman was kidnapped and sold off into slavery, and her son was taken and sold off to another person, and this is sort of a, if you, if you wanted to continue down that path, staying in the city, trying to solve that, rescue those people, deal with the sort of growing bad cult that's dealing in the city with, you know, kidnapping kids and forcing them into the mines and doing all these things. It's, you know, very, I would say, Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom style stuff. Um, as in the first book, there's a lot of mature, and I would say adult-themed stuff going on. This is not for younger players, which you would expect from an older, kind of old-school mentality game in a lot of ways, but some of it's, so, you know, so you keep that in mind if you're going to run this. It's, it's, there's a lot of um, <laughs> a lot of violence, a lot of grim stuff, a lot of death, a lot of destruction, and a lot of adult themes, and more explicit adult material. But not a ton of it. I wouldn't say it's 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 ubiquitous or anything like that. But it's a lot of it. But you can see. Okay, look at the art here. I mean, throughout the art is just great. The the maps are great, and the art is so delightful. Again, it's almost on every page. There is a piece on almost every single page, and there are different styles. And again, some people are going to like some more than others. I tend to like the more realistic, grittier pieces of art. Pe uh, pieces of art like this. this is Jacob Fleming. I always like Jacob Fleming as an artist. Um, but there are other um, sort of more cartoony styles in here as well, which weren't really in the first one. Uh, a new artist sort of has entered in, I think. And uh, I like it all. Like I said, there wasn't a single thing that I didn't like. Um, <clears throat> one of the villains that you're dealing with is the Yaga Shan, who's essentially... Um, the bad guy from Big Trouble Little China. There's a whole adventure in his tower here, which I love. You finally get to deal with Yaga Shan. He was kind of a villain behind some of the quests in the first book. He's in here, and you get to deal with him. Um, he's great. There's a cult that was also detailed in the first book. The first book details the cultures and the religions and the backgrounds of this, the history of the world. This one doesn't do that so much. It goes right into the world. There is a lot of stuff about the world and about the cults, and you're getting more details there, but this is not a, this is an adventure book, right? The first one had more setting material. This is just gets you right into the stuff. This is what one of the pieces of art that I mentioned before. It's kind of more cartoony. Um, looks more like something from, oh, I don't know you know, like uh, Adventure Time or something like that. It has that, that kind of vibe to me. Children of the Green Light, this is another adventure here uh, in the sewers of Vulcangard, which is the big city that's detailed in the first book. Yeah, it's a sewer adventure, goes down into mines beneath the city, cults, sewer hideouts, and then, you know, you're dealing with evil people doing evil things <laughs> with lots of evil monsters. So here's the conclusion from this adventure, the different possible outcomes of various aspects of the adventure. Um, and then Adventure Rewards, which I think is really, really cool. I love how every chapter does this. What are the monsters? Where are, or what, what are each of the monster sets worth? And the total XP values from that. And then treasure and magic items. More than that, there actually is this idea at the end of the book um, of giving XP for achieving certain things. And so you can go to that too, and it breaks down like per chapter and per book, what sort of XP could you get for each of these um, different achievements you basically do throughout the game if you wanted to add a little bit, not a milestone exactly, but something like, you know, sort of smaller milestones for experience points as you go through. Chapter 13, The Tower of the All-Seeing Eyes. This is Yag uh, basically, you know, um, Yaga Shan's headquarters. <laughs> I love the quote here. It's from Egg Shen, which is, he's the, this is the guy from Big Triple Little China. He's the, the good sorcerer. Um, it's a great adventure. The tower is really cool. It's this tower that's, it's, it's invisible, but it casts a shadow in the city anyway, and so you, you don't necessarily, you can't see the tower, but in certain times and at certain places, you can see, in fact, where the tower is, and there's certain ways of getting inside it. Really cool. Uh, and you have this crime lord, crime syndicate, and this is his headquarters, and so you're fighting a bunch of dudes. Heavily influenced by Big Trouble Little China. If you know that, you're going to be much more interested in this adventure. I love Big Trouble Little China. I have Jack Burton's shirt from that movie. Uh, I wear it all the time. Um, I love this I love it. So this fits right in with my my style. My I, I really, really like this. It's really cool. Really good adventure. Now, again, I haven't read through the adventures in detail, so I can't talk about balance. I can't talk about traps or tricks or things like that. But it, what I have seen looks amazing. 
and it looks a lot like the first book, and all of those dungeons and adventures were very, very good. Very well written, very well parsed, very well laid out. You have bullets, bullet pointings, you have buildings, you have italics. There is some read aloud description, which is not my favorite. I don't tend to like read aloud description, but usually you can adjust it if you need and, and move on. It's not my favorite thing, it's not the end of the world. Um, but just overall, this book is incredible. Clicking through, clicking through, I'm only 150 pages in out of 530. We haven't even yet gotten to the underworld, right? So this book is is supposed to be, it's mostly about the underworld beneath the Forbidden North, right? So it's the, uh, the, uh, the Underdark, essentially, the caverns and caves and passages and underground lakes and underground rivers and seas that you're dealing with down there and the various cultures and cities and locations and monsters and things that are down there. The first however long of this book is just a few adventures. <laughs> dealing with, again, follow-ups to the first book. So if you're playing through the first book, you have a series of adventures that kind of go through. And then there's just the general hex crawl with a whole bunch of ideas and, and uh, encounters and sort of connections out there. And you can play it one way or the other, right? You can play as a linear campaign where you play one adventure and then the DM's like, hey, it's been three months, you follow the leads to this next place, and now you're there. That's the sort of secondary way of playing it. It's sort of assumed that this is just going to be a big open world sandbox, and you're going to go around and find some of these and not find some of them and all that stuff. So the adventures here are not necessarily to be played in order. You could, and that's, again, the secondary way of playing it. But the first way is not intended there. And then you have Malgorgia or Malgorgia. There's a pronunciation guide at the back, so I don't know which one it is. Or Malgorgia or Malgorgia? I would say Malgorgia. It sounds cooler. Malgorgia, the Endless Underworld, has a quote from Tolkien, The Fellowship of the Rings, when they're in Moria. All about them as they lay hung in... As they lay, uh, all about them as they lay hung the darkness, hollow and immense, and they were oppressed by the loneliness and vastness of the Dolven wall halls and endlessly branching stairs and passages. So good. This is the picture I was thinking of. This is definitely an homage to into the into the unknown. I think is what it's called, right? Where there those adventurers are walking through the big forest of, of mushrooms in the underworld. Definitely, I I think at least <laughs> it's an homage to that. Journeys in the dark, you have the Malgorgian ecosystem, flora, fungi, and funga and fauna, food and water scarcity, and how that works, what the, the chances of hunt, foraging or hunting are, how to get water down here. Um, underground environments like chaos cavities, special things, lights in the darkness, hellish heat, wind and sound conditions. And then the general geography rules, so tunneled settlements between, uh, tunnel distances between settlements, and it has it on there on the right underworld distance table. So if you want to know how far it roughly is between one place and another, you can find it there. And those are in miles, not meters. <laughs> uh, M is miles. You're talking about a big underworld, right? You're talking about 160 miles, 114 miles, 102 miles, 120 miles, 90 miles, 36 miles from some of these things to each other. But you're talking about very long distances with lots of hexes between them. So travel under here is going to be a big deal. The different features, you have yawning vaults, uh, hypogean lanes, branchwork tunnels, fungal forests, undersea chambers, black rock tubes, magma lakes, and hemal byways. This is so cool. I love Underdark Adventures. I love them. I think you could easily add in some of those um, Underdark Adventures from Advanced Ancient or Advanced Adventures that I reviewed a while back, the ones about the uh, under, Underground River. You could add those in, and it would work just easily here. It's worth noting that there's a little bit of science fantasy. That's such a cool fungal creature. That's such a cool fungal creature. Oh, that's so awesome. There is a little science fantasy down here. Um, you know, kind of ridiculous, over-the-top gonzos ray guns and stuff like that. And that's not to everybody's taste. In the first one, I had initially thought, oh, it's aliens, but then it turns out it's more like supernatural, it's more like angels and demons and things like that, but there are some aliens. And in this game, in this in this book, there are definitely aliens. There's a whole adventure with ray guns and, you know, tech like that. So uh, keep that in mind. There's a, there's a note on how you could adjust it in here. Some people don't care. I don't care at all. I think that's great. The Flash Gordon, you know, Star Wars, um, science fantasy elements in a game, crawl, Right, which is kind of a mix of, of, I would say, fairy tale, high fantasy, and science fantasy all mixed together. I like that tone, but not everybody does. So, Here's the, the referee map of the Underdark, and it's a little bit hard to read just because of how zoomed out I am. You'd zoom in, probably get a bit more. You can see the hex names a little bit. They're, they're pretty faint. Um, but you, this also comes with a whole map pack, and so you have all the maps uh, as well, and you could always, always zoom in there. But it is, it is a little hard to read which hex is which. You're kind of like, wait, is that 11.1, 11.9? Okay, I got it. 12, what is that? 12.09. Okay, I got that. It's a little bit hard to see the names of each hex, the number of each hex. I wish it was a little bit bolder. But interestingly enough, 
um, you still have the breakdown of each of the locations. So, I mean, sort of like S01, U01, U4. Those are references to the different places. And it says underworld encounters. Each underworld encounter area is described in the following section by a letter and a number, which together correspond to a location on the underworld map. The letters signify connection regions. For example, B for bile ducts, D for dwarvish ruins, F for subterranean factions, G for gates in the Bellor's undead kingdom, for example. That's really cool. So if you once you learn those tricks, you'll know which is which and what kind of entrance it is and what kind of uh, entry you're talking about. And then you get um, the breakdown of each of the hexes. Starting from B01, B02, B03, B04, <laughs> B05, B06, B07. It goes through all of the locations. I love that piece of art. Very pulpy. Um, but it's got a different kind of style to it. Again, mostly there's art on every page, but not necessarily. Like, for example, there was one that wasn't. But here is a beautiful, this is the, the bridge to the Black City. And the Black City is a location that you can, that, that's detailed here. It's an underdark city. It was a dwarven city, and now it's fallen, and, and it's ruled by these creatures and all this stuff. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful locations. Really cool stuff happening in all of these places. Great pieces of art. A Yeti riot. <laughs> Horrible troll uh, matron thing. The ogre matron thing. You have an underground lake there. The Bone Blood Falls. Look at that. That's so creepy. I love it. The Outer Fortress. That's a great piece of art. That's so good. Man, I want that piece somewhere. Uh, else, I mean, I want, it, I want it frequently. I like it. Oh, that's so cool. The Gatehouse. Look at that. Look at that art. It's so good and so evocative. I love it. Absolutely love it. This is uh, a Cyclops Etten. Two-headed Etten. Or a two-headed Cyclops, I guess. Is it a Cyclopean Etten, or is it a two-headed Cyclops? That's a good question. Ooh, here's a worm eating a dude. Nasty. Great pieces of art throughout this book. Really, really good. Oh, yes. Good. A dragon. Gotta have a dragon. Dungeons and Dragons. You gotta have a dragon. Definitely have to. Even if it's not called Dungeons & Dragons, it is Dungeons & Dragons. <laughs> that horrible creature. It's like a bat arachnid thing. Yeah, it's not an arachnid, it's got six legs. I don't know, it's nasty. Really good creature there. Weird underground whale. <laughs> That's awesome. Giant creature there. Some more monsters, some more locations. It's kind of an odd piece, it's kind of cool. This is a dude hanging out in the middle of that column. Ooh, the Blackwater Vortex, Asteroid Temple, Ferryman to the Black City, the Gloom Flats. I mean, there's just so many ideas here, right? Even if you didn't want to run this as an adventure. Oh man, that's a great two-page spread. Love that. So creepy. Even if you weren't going to run this as an adventure. Straight up. 532 pages of ideas. Man, you'd be, it would be a mistake to sleep on this book. The Black City of Morgathar. And here is, here's the city. Um, you've got some creatures there, government and politics, the population, the different districts, um, all the different people here. One of the things you'll notice is there's a lot of reading in this book. I mean, it's like a full-on thing. It's not designed to be like... In, I mean, it's not designed in an, un, uh, in an inflexible way. I wouldn't say. It's just not designed to be like, you know, a... Uh, What's a good example? It's not designed to be something like, you know, <laughs> um, The Waking of Willoughby Hall or one of Gavin Norman's adventures, which are just like, you know, function first. Um, and, you know, form follows function sort of thing. This is, this is much more, this is taking its time. This book is taking its time. It gives you a lot of reading. It gives you a lot of art. It gives you a lot of information, a lot of flavor, a lot of tone, and hopefully, I mean, and I, can, I think it, I can speak for this already, a lot of good ideas. A lot of great ideas. So much, so much, <laughs> so much in this book is going to be so fun to run. That's why I'm waiting until I get all three, and then I'm going to run a Gods of the Forbidden North campaign. Absolutely. It's going to be great. I really can't wait. Look at that art, man. Little kobold dude with a Rubik's Cube thing. <laughs> Not really a Rubik's Cube. That's great. Uh, then you get the uh, Malum Hateus, which is the... Uh, Basically, the um, uh, Tomb of Horrors. Yeah, that's what it says here. Really, really cool. Yeah, the the the, the um, epigram here is 
enemies were teachers in disguise, right? That's a great way of thinking about a trap, deadly death trap dungeon. But it's really cool. You can see it's got definite inspiration uh, from the Tomb of Horrors. You'll see that in a lot of the art. That's such a great piece. There's like a beholder crab thing under the water. Yeah, he has a regeneration, his eye regeneration um, is a beholder, but uh, he can do his own thing. Gargadax is his name. Gargadax. Oh man, look at these <laughs> traps, these death traps. I remember this has so much art in this section. It reminds me of, again, like, I, 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 one of the cool things this book has is an illustration book. And so uh, for these sorts of dungeons, it would be really worthwhile to show your party some of these pieces of art. Maybe not all of them, but just so they get a sense of what an area looks like. Maybe not, again, all of them. Um, I love that one. I love that. <laughs> Evil bees. But some of these, right? Some of these that you definitely want to show them and give them a sense of what the thing looks like. So much art in here. It's kind of absurd. Man, this is just so cool. Um, so, I mean, it, it's another 200 pages, I'm, or 150 pages. I'm just going to scroll back to the beginning. Gods of the Forbidden North, Volume 2, guys. Excellent. Just as good as, as Volume 1, um, at least I think. Um, this book also comes with two other PDFs. You get one on the demi-humans of the world, of the Magis Terra, which is this particular world, and you get just information about them, and also some pre-made characters. So you have a handful. Um, again, these are old school essentials. So you have um, the acrobat, the assassin, the barbarian, the bard, the cleric, the druid, the fighter, the illusionist, the knight, the magic user, the paladin, the ranger, and the thief. So one of each uh, from the page 78 of the old school essentials advanced player's tome. Now what's really cool is that each of them have a secret um, the Acrobat must achieve three goals to complete the secret background quest. The information should not be shared with the Acrobat's player. Compose uh, his first play over 180 work days. For every 30 additional days the Acrobat spends revising the work, he gains plus one bonus to his final goals reaction roll. Second goal is gain the favor of an aristocrat who offers to review his first play and give it feedback. So the Acrobat Lion Tamer is a playwright. And then there's a thing there. So the assassin has secret goals. You give them secret goals that are in the background, they kind of eventually develop and make them into some characters. It's kind of a cool idea. I don't know how, how I feel about this, like a secret goal where the player doesn't know. I'd have to understand that a bit more. It's kind of a cool idea for the character to have a goal or at least for the character to have development that's beyond the player. Sometimes I, I think that's really cool. Usually what I, what I do in those sorts of situations though is I like to offer players moments of character development. For example, in, in one of my, um, but rather rather than force it, one of my players in a recent campaign, the one I'm playing now currently, though the, the sort of quasi medieval Spain campaign, um, his master, his uh, his teacher, has supposedly died, or he thought he died. He couldn't find his body. He disappeared, and, and all for all intents and purposes, he thought he was dead. And he got sort of the dead drop. His master was a Rasca die, and he gave him the uh, if you're reading this, I'm dead sort of thing. And then. They got a, they were talking to this weird half quasi crazy seer and the seer looked at them and said, or looked at him and said, he's alive without any context, just out of nowhere. And the player was like, I could either take this two ways, right? I could take this as a moment of the guy, oh, whatever. Or I could lean into it. And he did. He was like, oh man, no, he's alive. I know it. I, 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 I don't know why I doubt it. And he took his character in a very different direction. It was very cool because uh, up until that point, he'd been trying to develop this like, my master's dead. My master's dead. I have to learn to do things my own way now. I have to get along on my own. And then there was this choice where he could have kept doing that, right? He could have said, no, it's a lie. I'm just going to keep going. But he didn't. He did. He took the, he took the, you might say, the story bait, the character development bait, and was like, no, I think it would be much more interesting for my guy to, to start to doubt himself in his new independence. And secretly, he kind of wants to still be taught and still be directed and he doesn't want to be independent so he's he he grasps this and holds on to it and hopes and now he's going to maybe stunt his development as an independent you know thinker and as an independent actor because he's going to be so interested in trying to find his master again and, and doing what he would want to do so it's this really interesting character development moment um, but i didn't force it right i just said hey here's a thing what do you think i think that sort of quest background makes a lot of sense i'm not sure if these sort of secret backgrounds are the way i would go in addition to that, it looks like this is a pretty deadly adventure. I don't know how long these characters are going to last. I don't know if they're all going to survive. They might. 
And obviously, if they do survive, then you want them to have some payoff. Um, so I think it could go either way. It's a still, it's a pretty cool idea. But leaving that aside, it's such a detail. And, and I don't even think it's a necessarily negative one. Um, Gods of the Forbidden North Volume 2 is just a masterpiece. So good. I cannot wait for Volume 3. I'm already saying that. But really, I mean that because I'm, I, I do want to wait until I see the whole story, the whole background, everything, and tie it all together for one big campaign. So uh, I can't wait. This is, I can't wait to get the physical book for this. I'm going to read through it very carefully once I have the physical book. I'm going to go through and read every page. That's what I did with Volume 1, where I read through the PDF. I got the sense that I really wanted it. Got, I knew some sections pretty well. But then I waited until I had the physical book and just went through very carefully. That's what I'm going to do for this one, too. All right, guys. Well, I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you all in another video.